Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So um, last time we talked about we talked about everything we really need to know about first order systems. And with the first order systems, basically, you know, we we said we got a couple of different inputs that we're considering. Um, the big thing we did last time was I, I talked through how you would use if you had a cosine going into the differential equation and you had a particular solution you needed to figure out how you could use the Euler's identity, the complex numbers to be able to get to a solution. All right, so the lecture last time went through that. I also posted another video on the Canvas page that has a numeric example that walks, walks through it. It's just like, I think problem two on the current homework. All right, so it's, it's a pretty similar one. Problem one on the homework is pretty similar to what I did in class the other day. All right, so I posted those, the, the video and the, and the slides on that. Problem two is just like the example video that I posted, okay? Um, now I wanna talk about second order. Um, we're gonna talk about second order today and on Monday. And then we're gonna get into my last topic here, which is how do we deal with numeric solutions? And that's gonna get us into talking about the project and how we, how we use uh, MATLAB for this stuff. All right, so we, I talked about this non-homogeneous differential equations, constant coefficients. Um, non-homogeneous equations are ones where I have some kind of a, what I, the term I use is some kind of a driving function or driving force, meaning there's some input over here on this side, all right, that's, that's forcing this thing to do something. So there's, there's two solutions to this differential equation, right? What are the two solutions? What do we call them? There's a transient in particular. Yeah, transient and steady state and homogeneous are particular. Okay, those are two ways of saying it. Transient and homogeneous are the same, and particular and steady state are the same. Okay. The way way that I think about this is, I guess I took that slide out of here, but the, the particular solution or the steady state solution results from this input. And the, the transient solution comes from the fact that the whatever's in this circuit, whatever's in this system is trying to oppose the change that's happening. All right, so there's, there's two pieces. So what we talked about is in this case, I'm gonna have three different types of inputs that, we'll, that I'll consider in this class. So probably the most common types of inputs that you have for any real physical system, which is that I have a constant, okay? I have an exponential or I have a cosine. And, and the important thing is, if my input is a constant, my output is a constant. If my input's an exponential, my output's an exponential. If my input's a cosine, my output's a cosine. So in other words, the, the input and the output have to look like each other. If I have a cosine, that means that the output can be bigger or smaller and can be shifted left or right, right? That's what the, that's what the phi means. That's what the B means here, the fact that I can have this change. So it's always the case that the steady state output always looks like the input, right? They may not look exactly alike. They can be shifted, they can be scaled, but they're definitely going to look alike. They're in the same general shape to them, all right? Now I introduced this thing called U of T. U of T basically, what, what that is, is it's saying that's the, the function we call, well, actually, what name did I give U of T? Yeah, you, the step function or unit step. All right, so u of t basically is a function that's zero before t equal to zero, and then one for times after zero. All right, so if I have an input like this, a cosine omega t times u of t, what that means is I take something like the cosine and it's turned off before t equal to zero. All right, that, that, that basically replicates this function, right? If I, had a, if I had a switch here and I close that switch at t equal to zero, that's what basically enables me to ensure that it's a, or the U of T is a, is a mathematical way of capturing what that switch is doing, right? If I looked at the voltage across this RC circuit before T equal to zero, it would be zero. But when that switch closes, it becomes one volt. All right, so, so U of T is just modeling this scenario right here, okay? All right. Now our basic approach is three steps and the other day I went through a really detailed set of additional steps for step two, right? When I have, when I have sine waves. 
Today, we're gonna to try to expand on this a little bit more when we have second order systems, right? So basically, the first thing is I get the homogeneous response, then I get the particular, then I get the total solution with the initial conditions. So I started at the very end talking about second order the other day. If I have second order systems, how many, how many um, initial conditions do I need? Two. Two. All right. First order systems need one initial condition. Second order systems need two initial conditions. All right. So that's that's an important thing. So the first initial condition is on, in this case, y of t. All right. That's what I'm calling my output. What's the uh, what's the second initial condition that you always get with with a second order differential equation? One of them is for the output itself, and the other one is for what? The derivative of the output, right? I need one condi initial condition for the output itself, and then one for the derivative of the output. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna work through that a little bit today. All right, so so first order system, second order system. First order systems had one storage element. Second order systems had two. All right, so basically in the first order system, if I have sources, if I have energy sources, voltage sources, current sources, right, then the system gets to steady state once the energy storage elements are filled up. So in other words, you, you see a voltage on a capacitor get constant or, or the current in an inductor get constant. If I have no sources, what's always the case in a first order circuit with no sources, what's the final value of all the voltages and currents? Always, zero, okay, always has to be zero. In a second order system, that's not the case. I can have a system that has no sources, but this, the two devices, the current, the inductor and capacitor, they could actually be exchanging energy back and forth without ever having any sources in the circuit. All right, so it's a little bit different in this particular case. So in general, when I have a first order system, I have one exponential in my transient response. If I have a second order system, how many exponentials do I have? Two, right? Two. Now those two can be complex exponentials, right? That's the big difference, right? Now I can have complex exponentials. So let's, let's, we'll go through that process a little bit. Monday, I talked about this particular example right here, where I said I, I took a pendulum and this pendulum is a second order system, right? What I do is I take that pendulum. So the, the, the red ball there I can move and the black ball there is sort of a pivot. So as I've shown this here, I've pulled that, that ball back to 20 degrees. Now, if there's no losses in that system, what's, what's gonna happen with that ball? What's it gonna do? It's gonna go on forever, right? It's gonna, it's gonna start at 20 degrees, it'll get to negative 20, and it'll just go back and forth and back and forth like that. Now, if I begin to put a little bit of loss into the system, that initial potential energy that I started with starts to dissipate and get lost as heat. And the primary place I said this guy's gonna get lost as heat is where in this particular system? In, in that pivot, right? In that little sort of center point that it's moving around. So if there's just a little tiny bit of loss, I would still expect the ball to start out at 20 degrees and then swing past zero and maybe end up at like minus 19 or minus 18 and swing back and forth a little bit. Right. If I were to plot what the what the angle looked like in that particular case, if I plotted theta versus time, what would it look like if there was just a little bit of loss? Let me put it this way: if there was no loss, I would see theta go from twenty degrees to negative twenty to twenty to negative twenty like that, and it would move sinusoidally. If I solved, if I set up the physics and solved the differential equations, it would move sinusoidally. If Yeah, if there was a little bit of loss some, you know, from some friction, then the amplitude of this, of this sine wave would decay over time. And if I kept increasing the losses a lot, then eventually, by the time I got to a lot of losses, what would it look like? What happens by the time I get to a lot of losses? In other words, let's say that, let's say that it was really tight on that pivot. What would happen then? Become an exponential. Yeah, basically become an exponential. And actually become two exponentials, 
but they would look like one. I would call this response overdamped, all right, in this particular case. So we're gonna we're gonna look at that at that example a little bit more carefully. So if you want to see that, I, I linked it there. I've got a video demonstration that shows that where I actually I run a model and you actually see what the what the theta looks like. And I do the same thing for, for a circuit. All right. In a circuit, I have LRC here. And if I can actually get the resistance in the circuit, the losses to be zero, then I see the voltages and currents never stop. They just, they go back and forth sinusoidally. And then if I increase the resistance, then eventually the voltages and currents just look like they're exponential. All right, so the losses in the system have a lot to do with how this guy behaves, okay? So, <clears throat> That said, we're gonna go through our, our basic differential equation and try, to, and try to solve it, okay? So if I get a second order equation, I'm gonna say that it always has a form that looks like what I have right here, okay? So if, if I'm talking about circuits, this could be IL of T or, or which is the inductor current or the capacitor voltage, right? Those are my, my two scenarios. My differential equation always has the form like what I have right here. So notice a couple of things here. I, I, I'm always, I'm trying to be consistent with the book and I'm always calling my output Y. That could be a voltage, could be a current, all right? It's the output of the system. Whereas X of T is, I'm always calling that the input. That's somehow, that's like a voltage source that I'm hooking up to my circuit that's making it do something, right? Um, and I'm using this term where B and C are both constants here, okay? All right, and I typically like to get my stuff in that form. Now, if I have a number out here, usually what I end up doing is I divide the equation by A, which means that I would get a number X divided by A over here. That's perfectly okay, all right? In fact, we're gonna look at some examples like that here. All right, now at the end, this thing has a solution just like the first order where it's the particular plus the homogeneous. Now, the some, one term that's sometimes used for homogeneous is the characteristic solution, all right? And I, I call it that Y sub C throughout this whole thing, all right? Because that's what the book calls it. So if you go in chapter seven of the book, they use Y C and Y P, okay? All right, so same steps apply, all right? Same steps apply. So what I wanna do is I wanna go through the homogeneous equation and understand that a little bit, all right? As we go through this. So we always guess that our solution is of the form C e to the st, all right? What's gonna happen when I do that here? So if I, if I guess that solution and I drop it into this equation, what's, what's gonna happen? So I take the second derivative of C e to the st, and I take the first derivative of C e to the st, and then I have this, all right? What happens when I do that? What happens when I take the second derivative of e to the st? Once you end up with your characteristic equation? Yeah, well, I, yes, I'm gonna, so, so yes, you guys know some of the results here, right? So I get an s squared times C e to the st, all right, I bring an S squared down, plus I get B times C times S, right? I take the first order of E to the ST, first order derivative is S E to the ST. And then I get little C times big C E to the ST. Now, I can factor that, right? I got some common terms there. What are my common terms in each of those three terms on the left? C E to the ST. Yep, C E to the S T is common. So I pull that out and I get C E to the S T times S squared plus B S plus C equals zero. So I'm looking at that, right? I got three things that multiply each other that could all equal zero. We said C is not equal to zero because we said that was a trivial choice. None of this would, would mean anything if that was the case. What about E to the S T, is that ever zero? That's never going to be zero. It's never going to be zero. So I'm left with this fact that S squared plus BS plus C is equal to zero. Now, how many roots does that have? Two. Two roots. Okay, there's two roots. If I think about those two roots, the, the thing about them, right, is they can potentially be complex. 
So, all right, if I had to solve this thing, back to the old quadratic formula, right? What's my quadratic formula? How do I deal with that? How do I Negative B plus minus root of B squared minus four AC over two A. Okay, that was, that was fast, right? Negative B plus minus the square root of B squared minus four AC. So what's A in this case? One. So minus four C all over two A. All right, so that is my root, okay? Now, <clears throat> I call this thing right here the characteristic equation, all right? Somebody already used that term, right? And, and my, my roots always have this basic form. Now, those roots tell me a lot about our transient solution. There's always two of them, which means that I always get a solution of this form, always. You guys learn many forms of this thing in different places, but it always is that, because I guess that it was C e to the st. That's what I get, is C e to the st. But it's just the fact that CE to the ST could be complex, right? And then the result gets complex, which means that the result is a sine wave, okay? All right, so let's look at this guy here. Minus B plus minus B squared minus four C, this whole thing, let me not. So S squared plus B S plus C equals zero. <coughs> There's four possible solutions to that. What are the four possible solutions? What four ways could this guy look? Yeah, it all comes down to what does B squared minus 4C do, right? So that whole B squared minus 4C, that could basically be what? That could be equal to, well, I guess I'll do it this way. That could be zero, it could be less than zero, it could be greater than zero, okay? And then there's another scenario that I could potentially invest S in. S could be equal to zero? Uh, not that S would be equal to zero, because if S was equal A to repeated. zero, B could be equal to zero. Met repeated roots? Well, if I had, let's, let's, we'll deal with the B equal to zero case sort of in a, in a special way, right? Um, let's, so B equal to zero, then we have B squared minus 4C equal to zero. Actually, I'm gonna start it this way. Less than zero. Or 4C equal to zero. And then B squared minus 4C greater than zero, okay? All right, and let's, if I had B equal to zero, what are those roots gonna be? Uh, nope. So B equals zero, help me out. What's gonna, what's, what am I gonna see here? B is zero, what is, what? Mm, all right, if B is equal to zero, what do I get? I get plus, so B is zero, so the first term goes away. So I get plus minus, yep, plus minus square root of minus 4C over two. Now those are complex, right? But specifically, they're not just, I wouldn't call them just complex, right? Where's the, comp where's the complexity come imaginary. from? Imaginary. They're purely imaginary. Right? There's no real part to this, right? This guy has no real part. So no real part. So that means that I would get, just to think about this for a second, I would get something that's of the form E to the, look, looking at this guy, what I would get is E to the J something T and actually, all right, let me, let, me, let me just take it a little bit farther. So negative 4C over 2. So that would be plus or minus J times, what's the square root of 4? 2, right? So this would be plus or minus J times the square root of C. Okay. So that tells me that if I looked at my transient response, it would be E, 
there'd be some constant, right? But it would be e to the negative j square root of ct plus e to the j square root of ct. Now I know there's constants and such, right? And I'm, and I'm not putting those in there, but you've seen something like that before, haven't you? e to the negative something t plus e to the negative same something t. That's, that's a cosine, isn't it? So in other words, what I get, my transient response is sinusoidal, okay? Just like I said it would be if I had my pendulum here and I didn't have any resistance in it, okay? So with no loss, what I end up with, my transient response never dies. My transient response is just, it's gonna be a pure, I say it never dies, right? It's a sine wave, the sine wave never stops, right? It just continues up and down, up and down, on and on forever, right? If I had B squared minus four C less than zero, what happens in that particular case? Now I have a value of B. So let's say in, in these cases here, you know, B is not zero. You'll have a uh, complex, Roots with real and imaginary parts. Yep, these will be complex. So these were no imaginary part. This one was complex. If b squared minus 4c is equal to zero, what's true about the two roots of that equation? What are they? Well, okay, good question. Were these two conjugates here in the first case? Yes. They're both purely imaginary. One's positive, one's negative. Those are complex conjugates of each other. These guys here, if I solve them, they're gonna be complex and they're gonna be conjugates as well. All right, without me going through all the details on the math, all right, they're gonna be complex conjugates as well. <clears throat> what about B squared minus four C equal to zero? What's that? Repeated roots. In this case, I'm gonna get that my two roots are both negative b over two, right? So this is real and repeated. And this is often the one um, that I call stupid, right? And the reason for that is in the real world, it would never happen, okay? When I say in the real world, it would never happen because b and c, those are things that come from resistors and capacitors and such. I'd have to get incredibly precise resistors and capacitors to ever get to this scenario. So it doesn't really happen that often. Most of the time I have this scenario or this scenario. What do I have in this scenario here if B squared minus four C is greater than zero? What's true about that? That the solution would be a polynomial equation or not polynomial, but exponential. They're all exponential. They're both, both roots are real, right? Both roots are real, which, which, which is gonna lead to a regular exponential as you would think of it, right? Which I think is what, what the person online is saying there, right? So both roots are real. But the reality is they're all exponentials, right? And that's the important thing to remember. They're all exponentials, but <clears throat> this one here probably gives rise to the most normal exponentials that, that you guys would think of. In other words, purely real exponentials. So both roots are real, okay? Now, I, I, what I do here, I'm not gonna go through the, the notes here, but I, I, I'm not gonna go through this in excruciating detail, but you can go back through it. What I, what I do here is I, I, um, I put in here the, how the roots or how the terms in the differential equation relate to those roots, okay? So the first case that I did there is what I call undamped. This is where B equal to zero, right? We call it undamped. You guys are used to the term underdamped, overdamped, critically damped, right? What does undamped mean? What do you think? What is underdamped? What is damping? Okay, let's put it that way. What does damping mean? What does it mean to damp something out? Undamped means that the solution does not zero out as t approaches infinity. Yeah, okay. Undamped means the solution does not zero out as t approaches infinity. Yeah, that's a, that's a good mathematical description. Um, but damping is a term engineers use a lot, right? If I damp something out, what am I doing? I'm restricting it somehow. In other words, like if I, you know, so oftentimes 
you know, right now we got a project where we're trying to, we got to, you know, pulling a, pulling a cable on an EV charger out of a box, right? And I want to, it's got a kind of a wild response. I want to dampen it out, okay? So we talk about damping things a lot. Damping means I usually want to put losses into the system. I somehow want losses so that my response isn't some kind of a wild thing. So think about ringing a bell. If I took a bell and I rang it, right, the bell's going to ring for a long time. If you put your hand on the bell, though, what's going to happen to it? You're going to muffle the sound out. You're damping it. You're damping the, the oscillation of that bell. So that term damping refers to losses. The more I put losses into the system, the more I damp it. So undamped means there's nothing stopping it. There's no losses. Okay. Needless to say, nature doesn't like this. They're, they're usually nature needs some help to make this happen. All right. The last problem on the homework is one like this. All right. <clears throat> Underdamped. All right. Underdamped is where I have some losses and my roots are complex. Okay. Notice they're complex and they're conjugates of each other. All right. Now, in both this case one and this case two here, one, one comment I make here is that the, the coefficients on the exponentials and the roots are both complex. Okay. If I get to critically damp, the roots repeat. All right. So I have here what we change in our transient response. There's a whole uniqueness argument that we make, and the book talks about this, where I need to ensure that my two solutions are unique. So one way I can make sure that it's unique is to multiply it by T. And then those two solutions become unique. Okay. Then there is the case where I have overdamped, where I have a lot of losses in the system. And what I end up with is two roots that are real and then um, just two straight real exponentials. Now, again, all of them are exponentials, right? Even when I'm under damped, they're exponential. But what they do is they combine into that form. All right. So <clears throat> here in the notes, I've got a summary of what all the sort of the possibilities can be and how they relate. All right. We're going we're gonna to use this today to go through a couple of examples. All right. But this is probably where you guys are going to go back to all right, as you go through to try to do the homework. All right. No reason to write this down now. All right. Because, I, again, I'll post this. All right. Key thing here too is, I, so I mentioned this the other day, for any real system, the real part of the roots better always be negative, all right? I guess I could have zero if I have that undamped scenario, right? But they better always be negative. If my real part is positive, what does that mean about my transient response? If my real it part- It doesn't is, zero out. It doesn't zero out. In fact, it does the exact opposite of zeroing out. What does it do? If I had e to a positive number t, what happens as t goes to infinity? The response approaches infinity. The response approaches infinity. So not only does it not approach infinity, but it, or not, not only does it not go away, but it, it gets incredibly large, right? Which would imply that the capacitors could supply infinite energy or something like that. That's not possible, all right? That, and I, that's one thing, um, you know, when I teach 2112, I always take off points for that. Like if you, you should recognize that my transient responses become zero. So you better get a real part that is equal to something less than zero. Okay. If you don't, you wrote your differential equation for 2112 down wrong. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> that's how we do the, the transient response. Again, we're going to do an example here. I got two examples we're going to go through. But then I got my, my particular solution. I still got to do that, right? And that basically gets me to three possible choices, right? Either if I, have a, if, if I have a constant over here, then I guess a constant. If I have an exponential, I guess an exponential. If I have a cosine, I guess a cosine, but we don't use cosine, right? What do we end up using instead of cosine? I suspect for most of you guys, this already went out of your brain because you didn't look at anything related to the homework yet. Yeah, I, I basically say this guy here is the real part of B e to the J phi e to the J omega t times that U of t. Right. It's, it's fine. I, I fully expected you guys haven't thought about it. You took an exam Monday night, so I didn't expect that you really thought about this much since Monday. 
All right. Last step, right? I got to get the total solution. Total solution, I put them together and I need my two initial conditions. All right, so let's do that here with this example. All right, so what I have is a second order differential equation, all right, uh, that looks like this. And I'm given those, those two initial conditions. Y of zero is equal to 10 and dy by dt of zero is equal to one. All right, now I'm gonna try to solve this I'm going to be careful about this. I'm never, so you guys may look up and, and, and try to find ways to solve differential equations in MATLAB. MATLAB knows what I want to have for breakfast tomorrow, right? It, it's got a tool for everything. I am not asking you ever to solve the differential equations in MATLAB. All right? I'm asking you to do it by hand and use MATLAB as a tool to help you do it by hand. All right? But never asking you to solve them with MATLAB. So don't, don't get lost in that. I know that there'll be somebody who comes to office hours asking me that question. All right, it's MATLAB as a tool, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I go through this example, so I'm gonna show you how I would use MATLAB to help me out because it's got a lot of powers that'll help me out, okay? All right, Got to follow. I wanna follow my three basic steps. What's step one? What do I wanna do first? Transient solution. Now the transient solution means that I do what to that equation? I set it equal to zero, right? I get that U of T out of the picture, right? So I get that U of T out of the picture and I go to what I call my, my uh, homogeneous equation, all right? And then I guess C E to the S T or whatever as I, as I do that. When I guess the C E to the S T, I get to my characteristic equation, right? What's my characteristic equation look like for this guy? If I put in CE to the ST, what do I get as my characteristic equation for this particular? S squared plus 4S plus 6.25 Yep. equals zero. S squared plus 4S plus 6.25 equals zero. Now, how do I solve for S? Well, I can go to the quadratic formula or whatever. What I, what I do at this point is I use a tool that, that MATLAB has Again, you don't have to, all right? You could solve for this by hand, it's not hard. You've known the quadratic formula for a long time. But what I do is I use this formula in MATLAB or this tool called roots, okay? Now what roots will do is I give it the coefficients of all the polynomials. And then what it does is it tells me what the two roots are, all right? So it solves it for me. So in this, so notice what I do. I'm given it a row vector here. So this is a row vector. And notice what I do. The last entry is always the constant term, right? And then I just build from there. Then the S term is here and the S squared term is here, right? And it gives me the two roots, okay? So, there's two roots. Those two roots are complex conjugates of each other, okay? So if I get roots that are complex conjugates like this, I'm gonna call this guy here S1, and I'll call this guy here S2, okay? All right, so what's, what, uh, what type of solution is this? What, what does this guy look like? Underdamped, overdamped, critically damped? What kind of damped? Under, under damped, right? So this guy's got to be under damped. All right. Now, what's that mean that the solution looks like? Well, it's this. It's always that. It's always C1 e to the S1t plus C2 e to the S2t. Doesn't change. Doesn't matter if it's undamped, underdamped, overdamped, critically damped, doesn't matter. All the same, right? But in this case, this guy's going to simplify it. What's he going to simplify to? What are my exponentials going to do if I have these complex conjugates like this? If I put that into Euler's identity, this guy should end up becoming a cosine. A cosine. It's going to become a cosine, and because of this real part, it's going to become a decaying cosine. Okay, all right. So we're gonna let's let's keep going with that, and we'll 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 check on that. 
So this is my this is my transient solution here, right? I get something of this form, or those those are my S ones and my S two. Okay. Now <clears throat> that's all I'm going to do for now. All right. I don't need to do anything else at the moment. All right. In fact, <clears throat> if I went into MATLAB and I knew what the values of C1 and C2 are, I could just, I could put this in there and MATLAB would end up plotting for me a cosine. All right. It would have the right shape for me. Just using Euler's identity. We'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit further. Let's go to my step two. My step two is to get the particular solution. Right, so I have a constant here right, as my input, 2u of t. So I guess that I have a constant. Okay? So I guess that I have a constant. So if that's the case, what should I do next? What do I do in this case? What, how do I, what do I, what do I have to do? This, this I call the undetermined coefficient. So I have this u of t. Remember, u of t means that before t equal to zero, it's zero. And then after t equal to zero, it's equal to, in this case, two, okay? So what I do is I say, well, for t greater than or equal to zero, how do I write this equation right here? I substitute my guess in there. So I say for t greater than or equal to zero, I have d squared by dt squared, put b in. Okay, plus four times d by dt of b plus 6.25 times b equals two. Okay, basically put this guy into that equation. Now, <clears throat> if I take derivatives of a constant, what do I get? Zero. zero. Yeah, so I get a zero here, I get a zero here, and I end up with 6.25 times b equals two, which gives me that b equals two divided by 6.25, or if I do the math, 0 0.32. So that means if I, if I look at my steady state result here, my steady state result better be 0 0.32 high after t equal to zero. All right, after t equal to zero, right? Because I don't have an input until t equal to zero. All right, so, all right, we got that. What's the last step? I got to add them all together, right? And that's, gonna, that's where this is going to get messy, right? Because my transient response was messy. So here it is, right? So I got my total solution here, okay? My total solution is y of t equal to 0 0.32 plus c1 e to the s1t plus c2 e to the s2t. I didn't even pay any attention to the fact that it was complex. I just threw it in there. Now, I also need to take the derivative of that, okay? So if I take the derivative of this expression, so dy by dt, all right, is basically d by dt, of 0 0.32, right? This was my yp. This is my y sub c. Like this. What do I know about 0 0.32 if I take the derivative of that? Zero. The derivative of c1 e to the s1t, I bring an s1 down. The derivative of c2 e to the s2t, I bring an s2 down. So I end up with this guy. All right, now, what do I do with that? Got to use my initial conditions, right? So in this case, we got to go back to the beginning. Did I give initial conditions? Yeah, I said y of zero is equal to 10 and the derivative at zero is equal to one, okay? All right, so what do I do? How do I set this up? Well, what I do is I basically say, let's look at y of zero. Y of zero, I said, is equal to 10. That's got to be equal to plug t equal to zero into here. So that's equal to 0 0.32, 0 0.32. And then what's, what happens when I plug t equal to zero into e to the something times t? One. 
So what's what happens to this these two terms right here? Yeah, C1 plus C2. Okay. And what about y d so dy by dt of zero? Oops, it's ugly look. I said that was equal to one. What's that become? If I plug in t equal to zero into that expression. Yeah, S1, C1 plus S2, C2, like that, okay? Just like that. Now, um, so let me put it, okay? So I have 0 0.32 plus C1 plus C2, and this becomes S1, C1, plus S2, C2. Now, before we get too lost in the math on here, what thing do I, what things do I not know at this point? C1 and C2. I know S1 and S2. S1 and S2 were the two roots. Now they were ugly, right? They were, they were these two guys here. They were complex, right? But I know them. they're just numbers to me. What I don't know is C1 and C2. To me, this looks like a perfect job for MATLAB, doesn't it? Because what is this? This can be set up as a matrix problem, can it? How can I set this up? And I got two, two unknowns, right? And two equations. I can set this up as a, as a matrix problem pretty easily. So how would I set this up in matrix form? Get my unknowns onto one side. <clears throat> All right, so that, this guy's problematic for me here, right? So what do I gotta do with him? Yeah, subtract 0.32 from both sides. I get 9.68 equal to C1 plus C2. And then this guy is cool with me already. I have one equals S1 C1 plus, plus S2 C2 like that, okay? So if I put that, help me put that in matrix form. What do I put? How do I do that? The things I'm solving for are C1 and C2. So I put those here, okay? What do I do with the 9.68 and the one? Put them on the left side, 9.68 and one. What goes into this matrix over here? Coefficients. So what are the coefficients on C1 and C2 in the top equation? One and one. What are the coefficients in the bottom equation? It's like S1 and S2, okay? <clears throat> now, we talked before about how to enter something like that in the MATLAB. Let's, let's kind of review it, all right? So here's, here's what I have in my, in my code when I do this, <clears throat> is I take this whole thing here. I say this guy here is B, equals a times c, I guess, is that how I, yeah. So, so b is 9.68 and one, a is equal to one, one, s1, s2, like that, okay? Now, what's the size of this vector? Two by one, yeah. Right, this is a column vector. This guy's uh, two rows, one column. What about this guy? Two by two, two rows, two columns. Okay, what's C, the, the solution vector? Two by one, two rows, one column. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so notice how I put that in here. Here's B, all right. I put 9.68 semicolon one. What's the semicolon always do? Creates a new row, okay? <clears throat> and then for A, what I did was I put one, one, then a semicolon. That way one and one are on the same row. And notice what I did here. I have S of one and S of two, because what I did was I, I in this case, I solved using this roots equation, 
to get my two roots. Okay. Now, this is one of those things like when you guys were doing the angles, when I asked you to do X to the nth power or whatever. <clears throat> Always, you know, you want to be careful to make sure that you're choosing the right root, right? If I have one root bigger than the other one, or I usually give you guidance on the homework to say which root should be the one that goes first, right? Usually it's, it's whichever one is, is got the positive imaginary part or something like that, all right? But just be careful. Look at the wording on that. When I look at this, what I, what I get is I get two values. So this is the same thing I talked about before. If I wanna solve for the, those, those two values of C1 and C2, I do inverse of A times B, right? Just solving a system of equations. And I get C1 is equal to this value and C2 is equal to that value, all right? <clears throat> so what this, and then what I did here was I, I just took the angle and the magnitude. So one thing I notice about these two things, what do you see about, what do I call C1 and C2 right there? There's a term for those two complex numbers like that. What's the, the uh, they're what? The I know what you're trying to, not conjunction, conjugate, right? <laughs> conjugate, right? So they're, they're complex conjugates of each other, which means that their angles, right, are, are gonna be um, negative of each other as well. Okay, so, and their magnitudes are the same. Okay, so what I end up with, if I go through and I take my C1 and my C2 and I, and I put those together. So what I did here, all right, so let's just, my original Y of T was 0 0.32. My original Y of T was this, all right? That's what I got. If I take, the C1 and C2. So what I did here was I, I said, if I take my C1 and C2, and the other thing I did, okay, so let's, let's, be, let's be super clear. This is S1 and this is S2, okay? So if I, if I look at that and I plug those in, right? So I'm gonna say plus C1 E to the S1T, so that's negative 2T times e to the j 1.5t plus c2 e to the negative 2t times e to the negative j 1.5t, okay? All I did was plug in S1 and S2 right there, right? Where if I look at e to the S1t, e to the S1t is e to the negative 2 plus j times 1.5, T, right? That you should see, right? Is e to the negative two t times e to the j one point five t. All right, you should be able to see that pretty quickly, right? What I have here is that c one and c two are complex conjugates of each other. So, so what I do is I take those two things and I have zero point three two plus. If I put in C1 and C2 as they are, recognizing that they're complex conjugates, I get, I don't want to spend the time writing it out because I'll probably do it wrong anyway. I get this, okay? Now, if I look at just this piece right here, that's familiar to me, right? Where have I seen that before? What's that? What's that? Well, it looks, okay, so there's the dynamic phaser sort of looks to it. You said something, Mom. Uh, uh, the, the two backward and forward vectors. Yeah, that's right. So this, this guy looks like to me, remember if I, I said if I had cosine of theta, what is cosine of theta equal to in terms of those rotating vectors? One half times what? E to the J theta? plus one half e to the minus j theta. So if I look carefully at this expression right here, right? We said that when theta was equal to omega t plus phi, like that, that this guy basically became one half e to the j phi, e to the j omega t plus one half e to the minus j phi, e to the minus j omega t. 
like that. Okay, that's exactly like what I have right here, isn't it? So help me use this Euler's identity to turn this into something here. How do I turn this expression into something? This becomes a cosine, doesn't it? What's that cosine going to be? Cosine of what? Would it be two times the cosine of 1.5t minus 54.5? Yep, two times the cosine of 1.5t minus 54.5 degrees, like that. Okay. So if you look back, just for your own kind of edification here or what you're going to want later right so this guy was an under damped response and i basically stated that right here so notice real quick so I, I said that the imaginary part of my roots is the frequency of this thing the angle of c1 is the angle that ends up being in here and the magnitude of c1 it's two times that magnitude that finds its way into here now, it's pretty straightforward if you're comfortable with this stuff to go through that every time, but I, I wanted to summarize that here for you, all right, in terms of how the roots relate to what that final response uh, ends up looking like, okay? All right, and this is what it looks like in each of those cases. All right, and that's what I ended up with here. If you look carefully, right, I should stop there for a second. I have two times the magnitude of C1, times e to the real part t. And then I have cosine of omega d. Omega d was the imaginary part of the root. And then in the angle of C1, okay? So that's what I ended up with when I, when I did it the hard way, all right? So I end up with this result, all right? 0 0.32 times two, but I don't, whatever that is, e to the negative two t times that cosine function. All right, now, I wanna plot that in MATLAB, okay? This guy's a little harder to plot in MATLAB, isn't he? Why is this guy gonna be hard to plot in MATLAB? So first of all, I gotta plot a time vector. I wanna plot something versus time. What's the first thing I gotta do anytime I wanna plot something versus time? What do I have to do? Uh, I gotta define my time vector, right? And, and maybe, I, maybe, I de maybe I'd somehow define that by the period, right? Um, in this case, how would I figure out the period? What would that be? What's the period here? Two pi over 1.5, whatever number that works out to be, okay? But I gotta define a time vector and then I basically define Y of T at that time vector. So somehow I'm gonna say, um, and again, I always give you a time vector. It's always a row vector. It starts at zero, has steps and ends at a certain point. On, on your homework, I always give you a time vector or at least I tell you how to choose the time vector, okay? <laughs> Looking at this then, I have, I would define cosine. What about this? I got a problem here, e to the negative two t and then cosine 1.5 t, right? If I defined cosine at all of the points in t and I defined e to the negative two t at all the points in t, this gets us back to something I had you looking at on homework two, I think it was. Isn't this problematic? What am I trying to do? I want to multiply every value in cosine by its complementary value in e to the negative 2t. So if I think about this, if time is a row vector, cosine is a row vector, and e to the negative 2t is a row vector, can I multiply two row vectors? This was problematic. What did I have to do if I wanted to multiply each entry? So entry one in e to the negative two t times entry one in the cosine and entry two in e to the negative two t times entry two in the cosine. Dot, the dot multiply. It's not really dot product, but it's a dot multiply. All right, it's what we call it, an element wise operation. So here's, here's my code for this, my overall code for it. All right, so notice by the time I get all the way down here to the end. Here, here's that dot multiply for me. All right, <clears throat> so I'm taking that exponential and I'm multiplying it by cosine, okay? Now, what I did here is I, I plotted three different things, YP, YC, and Y, okay? 
Which one is the particular solution? Which one is which? Yep, this guy is my particular. And the way I did that, I talked about this in the example last time, I took a vector of ones that has the same size as the time vector. That's basically how I'm creating the unit step, okay? And then, which one is Y sub C? They're a little bit light there, so hard to see, but I got a green and a yellow. Which one is it, the green or the yellow? The yellow. Why is the yellow the transient? Because it goes away. So the green one here is YP plus YC, whereas the yellow is just the transient response, right? Because the transient response eventually goes to zero. Whereas if I look at the green one, it's basically settling out at the steady state solution, which it should do, right? The transient goes away, but the steady state stays. All right, <clears throat> so I can see them all on top of each other. Now, in this case, I would call this a heavily overdamped, or sorry, a heavily damped system, right? Um, the reason is, yeah, there's a cosine here, but it's, you don't see much of an effect of that cosine, right? So in other words, it's, it's overshooting, that's the, the way I, the way that I talk about an underdamp is I see that it overshoots its final value. In other words, it goes past it and then comes back. In this case, he's not overshooting it too much. He just goes a little bit past and then comes back. That's a heavily, a pretty heavily damped system. All right. So that's, you know, all of, if you look at how I did this, all right, I, I basically started out with, I identified my characteristic equation, used that roots thing. Then I basically entered my values in here. And then I went through and defined a couple of things. I, I said the imaginary part of my root was this frequency of this cosine. And the real part was this thing I called sigma. And you'll see, I, you know, I don't need to make those definitions, but I did, all right? And I related them back to what's on this slide right here, okay? So it's a pretty straightforward way to kind of kind of think about it. All right, so I think we have enough time to try to do one more example here, or at least to start this example. All right, so here's, here's this guy, all right? D squared Y by DT squared plus four DY DT plus three Y equals four cosine 10 T plus 45 degrees. And then I've got my two initial conditions, okay? Now, first step is to get the transient response. Second step is gonna be to get the particular solution. In this case, what's my particular solution going to be? Skip ahead to my particular solution. What's that going to be? It's going to be a cosine 10t plus 5. All right. I know that my particular solution is going to be a cosine, which means to figure out what the, what the values are there, I'm going to do complex exponentials. Okay. So we're going to get to that. All right, let's first do the homogeneous thing here. All right, so if I do, if I go through the homogeneous, um, I brought the numbers, so I didn't have to work out the math here. If I do the homogeneous here, what's the first step? First of all, the homogeneous equation in this particular case. So I got a four, three. So the homogeneous equation, what's the difference between the homogeneous equation and the non-homogeneous? equal to zero, right? So I get D squared Y sub C, right? I always say Y sub C because I'm solving for the transient. DT squared plus four DYC by DT plus three YC equals zero. All right, now what I can do is I say, I guess that it's C E to the ST, but we know that that's gonna lead us to the characteristic equation. What's the characteristic equation I get from this? Yep, S squared plus four S plus three equals zero. So if you ask me what I do for that, right? That's where I go to MATLAB and I say, MATLAB, what are roots of one, four, three? And it'll tell me, all right? If I go through and I try to solve that in this particular case, right, it's actually super easy. I mean, in this case, I could just say, I, I, I know from algebra one that it's that, 
All right. S, I can factor that like this. This guy's going to have two roots. S1 equals um, minus, I don't know what I called it. I don't want to be careful. S1 is minus three and S2 equals minus one. Right. Notice in this case, they're both real. And what are they also both? They're both real, but also both what? Both real, but also negative. Not repeated. Well, not repeated. They're real, unique, and they're negative. They better always be negative, okay? They have to be negative to make sure that it's truly a transient response. A real physical system always better have negative roots or else it's not a transient response. It's a response that becomes infinite, okay? So what kind of damping do I have here? I've overdamped. And what's this Y sub C of T look like? Well, they all look the same. This guy's e to the s1t plus c2 e to the s2t for t greater than or equal to zero, right? Because there is no transient response before t equal to zero. Okay, all right. So I have that. Now in this case, those are going to be true exponentials. They're going to be entirely real, right? They're just going to decay. It's not like I'm not going to get some kind of a sinusoid out of this thing. Okay. Now, I'm back to the other problem. I want to get to the, I don't want to do anything else with it at this point. I want to focus on this particular solution piece. All right, what I have is A cosine omega t plus phi. I, wrote, I called it phi x because there's some phase shift in that input. Okay. The voltage, you know, in this particular case, so, this, so my system could be, you know, some sort of LRC circuit or something like that. I guess that my particular solution is going to be um, for this YP equals B cosine omega T plus phi, okay? In this particular case, my X of T was four cosine 10 T plus 45 degrees, okay? So the phi X here is the 45 degrees, the omega is 10 and the A is four, all right? What I said last time is I can think of these three things at, or these two things as the same. So what I said is I could just forget this whole real part thing. I could just assume that my input instead of being cosine was this exponential. And then what do I do at the very end? What do I do at the very end? I'm gonna basically assume my input has this form rather than the cosine. And what do I do at the very end when I'm done? I take the real part of it, right? If I took the real part of A e to the J phi X e to the J omega T, that would be A cosine omega T plus phi X. So I basically assume my input is this guy. And then I take the real part when I'm all done, okay? So last time we talked about that in terms of, of a couple of steps, right? So I said, I guessed that it was this B cosine omega T plus phi. I get that non-homogeneous equation into complex exponential domain. So as I take the input and get it to complex form, put this into it as my guess, and then get one equation for the magnitude, one for the angle, and then take the real part of the result. All right, that's the process. And it's pretty straightforward. All right, so in this case, it, does, it seems complicated at first, but it's fairly straightforward. All right, so what am I gonna do in this case? I'm gonna guess that my Y sub P is basically B E to the J phi, E to the J omega T, and then take, take the real part at the end, and omega is gonna be 10. How did I get omega is 10? How did I know that? Because the input had 10. All right, the input had 10. All right, so I'm going to write out, so d squared yp by dt squared plus 4 dy by dt plus 3y equals, this will be yp. So my second step here was to get the non-homogeneous equation into complex exponential domain. So how do I do that? The heck is that trying to do? Well, that means I need to get this 
four cosine 10 T plus 45 degrees into complex exponential format. So four cosine 10 T plus 45 degrees. What do I write for that? What do I write for four cosine 10 T plus 45 degrees? I write that dynamic phasor thing. What's the dynamic phasor for this thing? Four cosine 10 T plus 45 degrees. So four cosine 10 T plus 45 degrees. What's the dynamic phasor? So two E to the 45 T E to the J 10 T. So four E to the J 45 times E to the J 10 T, right? So I said, if I take the real part of that dynamic phasor, it gets me back to my original cosine. If it would be two, if I was talking about that, the two rotating vectors, in this case, I'm talking about one rotating vector and I'm taking the real part of it. So what I do is I say, this whole thing is equal to four e to the j 45 degrees times e to the j 10 t. Okay. Now, what I do is my third step here. I substitute in b e to the j phi e to the j omega t. Okay. When I do that, right, I'm going to say I get the second derivative of b e to the j phi e to the j omega t plus four times the first derivative of b e to the j phi e to the j omega t plus three times b e to the j phi e to the j omega t all equal to four e to the j 45 degrees e to the j omega t. Now, it's ugly. What happens when I take the derivative of e to the j omega t? What do I get when I take the derivative of e to the j omega t? J omega gets spit out, right? throws out the j omega t comes down, right? So it becomes, this middle term becomes four times j omega times b times e to the j omega t, right? This guy gets repeated, right? And it's all equal to that. What happens to this term? What happens with the second derivative? I get a J omega squared. Yeah, so I get essentially J omega comes down twice. B e to the J phi e to the J omega t. Before I do anything further with this, there's gonna be e to the J omega t, e to the J omega t, e to the J omega t, e to the J omega t. E I got e to the j omega t everywhere, right? So what does that mean I can do with the e to the j omega t? Get rid of it. Time disappears from the differential equation. That's the beauty of it, all right? So now I, I get <coughs> j omega squared times b, and I end up with a b e to the j phi in each of these terms. I forgot that b e to the j, e to the j phi e to the j omega t. All right, b e to the j, I'm gonna, there's a b e to the j phi in every term. So let me do it this way, plus four j omega plus three all times b e to the j phi equal to four e to the j 45 degrees. Okay, what's j squared? negative one. So this guy becomes negative omega squared. Like that. And omega is a number, omega is equal to 10, right? So this guy, so this guy would become just a complex number over there. How many equations is that? Is that one equation? How many equations is that? It's two, right? That's what I said the other day. How is that two equations? So uh, magnitude and angle. Magnitude and angle, or a real and imaginary part. But usually we do magnitude and angle, right? So I do one for the magnitude and one for the angle. All right. So if I go through that process, 
right? I end up with and saying, all right, that if I take the magnitude of everything on the right, I end up saying, okay, the magnitude of minus omega squared plus three plus four times j omega, that magnitude, what's the magnitude of b times e to the j phi? One, well, not one, the magnitude of e to the j phi is one. It's b, right, equal to, what's the magnitude of four e to the j 45? Four, that's equation number one, that'll solve for b. What's the other equation I got? I take the angle of both sides. What's the, so I say the angle, the angle of minus omega squared plus three plus four J omega, okay? Plus the angle of B e to the J phi. What's the angle of B e to the J phi? Phi, okay, plus phi equals the angle of four e to the j 45. What's the angle of four e to the j 45? 45, okay? I got two equations and two unknowns that I can solve for to find phi, okay? Now I can put all this together, all right? And, and what I end up doing is I end up taking this equation. What I did was I wrote this equation right here, this equation right here. I wrote that out essentially um, using MATLAB, all right? And I solved it that way. Now I'm gonna stop there because I'm out of time, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish this on Monday, but what I'll probably do is I'll record the rest of this as just an example um, so that you guys can see it, all right?